Okay, well, thank you very much for the invitation. And it's a real pleasure to speak at my old friend uh, Yao's 75th birthday conference. So um, I'm going to talk about a subject which really originates with uh, some of our earlier work. So around um, 1977, uh, we were together in, um, in Berkeley, and we started to make progress on some geometric questions which arose from um, general relativity. And those questions were formulated uh, in space-time, which was uh, uh, three plus one, four-dimensional. And so um, we developed methods to um, solve some of the problems uh, in those cases. And then several of the, the theorems also have natural extensions to higher dimensions. And so, um, and so it turns out when you consider the n-dimensional versions of those, there are certain issues that arise. And I wanted to... Um, give a talk about <clears throat> a few of those uh, theorems. So, um, so I'm gonna talk ab about uh, really three different theorems. I'm, I'm gonna give just a general uh, idea of the, the, the proof of those and, and, um, <clears throat> and um, some of the issues that come up in, in, the, um, in higher dimensions. And so, and so the, the first one is the Riemannian positive mass theorem. Uh, the second one is the Riemannian Penrose inequality. And the third one is the space-time positive uh, energy theorem. Okay, and so again, that the purpose of the lecture, uh, the, the goal of the lecture is to just review the theorems. Uh, and um, so in, in each of the theorems, they were originally done in three dimensions, uh, and then uh, they were extended up to dimension seven. And so there's a restriction to dimension seven, and that restriction um, is uh, arises from the fact that s some of the constructions which involve um, volume minimizing type hypersurfaces um, have possible singularities in higher dimensions. And so because of those singularities, it limits the, the, uh, the uh, possibility of doing the arguments in higher dimensions. And so I wanna discuss those issues and also um, in some cases uh, talk about methods that uh, uh, can be used to remove the dimensional restriction. Okay, so let me begin with um, the preliminaries from relativity. So um, we can consider uh, an n plus one dimensional space time. Uh, we call it script S. And then uh, we know that the Einstein equations are a set of evolution equations which uh, evolve from initial data. The initial data consist of a uh, space-like hypersurface uh, with two uh, tensor fields on it, namely the, the induced metric and the second fundamental form. Uh, and this 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 uh, triple is called an initial data set, and um, it, and that initial data set determines the space time via the uh, the Einstein equations. And so, um, <clears throat> if you consider the the Einstein equations with um, uh, with matter fields present, then um, then there's a set of equations induced on the initial data, which are called the constraint equations. So they come from the Gauss and Kadatsi equations. Uh, together with the Einstein equations, and they can be written in this way. So, so the mu and the j are properties of the matter fields that are that are present. If there are matter, if, if it were a vacuum space time, those would be zero. And so, the first equation, the scalar equation, says that mu, which is the observed mass density of the matter, is given by this expression involving uh, g and k. So, the the first term there involves only g. That's the um, the scalar curvature of the Riemannian metric G. And then these terms are <clears throat> polynomial terms in, uh, in, uh, in K. So the trace squared minus the square of the second, the, the norm squared of K, the second fundamental form. And then the, uh, the second, the, the, the vector constraints are, are the, what we call Ji. So that's the, that's the observed momentum density of the matter. And that's the divergence of a tensor constructed from the the uh, second fundamental form. So it's K minus trace K times G. So those equations are a consequence of the Einstein equations um, <clears throat> from the ambient space restricted to the, uh, they, they give restrictions on the, um, the initial data, G, G and the K. And so, um, so again, the, the mu and the J are properties of the, <clears throat> of the matter fields. And they're, um, so a space-like hypersurface de determines an observer which moves, moves normal to the, Hypersurface. So those are uh, observed by an observer going moving normally, orthogonally to the space-like hypersurface. Okay, and so um, so I'm gonna the, these 
all three theorems I mentioned deal with uh, asymptotically flat space times, and so and so those are um, those are uh, uh, space times which um, near infinity look like um, they look like Euclidean space, and the second fundamental form uh, has appropriate decay. And I've written down the the almost optimal decay conditions uh, that we can allow in this. So the the metric is assumed. So outside a compact set, the manifold looks like the exterior of a ball in in Rn, <clears throat> and the metric in suitable coordinates it looks like the Euclidean metric plus terms that fall off at a particular rate. So x to the minus p. It's very important, of course, how fast the fall off is. So in order to do what we want, the um, the fall off has to be faster than n minus two over two, uh, half of the uh, <clears throat> the fall off of the Newtonian potential. And the second fundamental form, being essentially a derivative of the metric, falls off one order faster. <clears throat> and then the notation sub two and sub one uh, means that you can differentiate the the fall off. So so it means that a derivative of g would fall off like a derivative of mod x to the minus p. So it would fall off one order faster. And so you need, we also need two derivatives on g and one derivative on k in order to prove the theorems, these theorems. And so the picture of an asymptotically flat manifold is that near infinity, it looks a lot like Euclidean space up to uh, some deviation terms. <clears throat> and in the compact part, it's uh, arbitrary. So this is a, could be arbitrary topology or, or um, um, the metric is unrestricted. <clears throat> okay, and so and so the um, <clears throat> two basic examples, of course, the first example is uh, is just Minkowski space. So it's Rn plus one with the, the flat Lorentz metric um, minus Vx naught squared plus the Euclidean metric in the last n variables. And so that's the uh, space-time of special relativity. So it has zero curvature. And then the, the simplest curved example is the Schwarzschild space-time. And so the Schwarzschild space-time, of course, originally was found in, in three plus one dimensions, but it, it has a natural extension to n dimensions. And so, and so it's, a, it's a solution which is, which is rotationally symmetric. And, um, and so it can be written uh, in conformally flat coordinates. And so, so <clears throat> I'm going to write it in this form. So, so it's, the initial data is k is zero. So it's, it's, uh, it's uh, initially at rest for the Einstein equations. And the metric is this metric. So it's, uh, it's defined away from the origin. And this E is a number. It's, it's, it's called the mass or the energy of the Schwarzschild metric. And <clears throat> I've written it here in conformally flat form. So, so the scalar curvature of this metric is zero. It, it satisfies the the vacuum constraint equations, this initial data set. Uh, and, um, and so that is equivalent to saying that this function inside parentheses there is a harmonic function. Right? It's one plus, this is the, uh, a multiple of the Green's function, the, the, um, <clears throat> just the Newtonian potential. And so, um, so it's defined for mod x positive, and you can think of it as the analog of the exterior uh, uh, field of a point mass in, in Newtonian gravity. It's, it's a static black hole solution of the Einstein equations. Okay, and so, and so an important thing about, um, about um, asymptotically flat um, uh, spaces or space times or initial data is that um, they, they have um, uh, sort of well-defined, robustly defined global quantities. There's a there's a notions of total energy and total linear momentum, and so I've written those so that they can be so 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 they're um, the fact that these limits exist is based on the the fall off conditions and also the constraint equations, and so the energy is given by this the the this limit of of a, a boundary integral. So it's the integral over a large sphere in the Euclidean coordinates, uh, and then these are, this is the partial with respect to the ith coordinate of gij minus the partial jace coordinate of gii and this is just the 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 outer unit normal for the euclidean metric so it's uh, xj over r if you like um, and then the uh, the linear momentum which is a vector is given by this expression so it's um it's the contraction of pi ij with the coordinate coordinates xj and then again there's a suitable dimensional factor and then then the limit um, and so here Omega n minus one is just the volume of the unit n minus one sphere. 
Okay, and so the, the so the constraint equations together with the fall off conditions implied the existence of, of these these limits. So these limits were defined by uh, by ADM Arnowit, Desser, and Misner, and they discussed various properties of these uh, these um, uh, these uh, these conserved quantities. So these, these are called the ADM uh, energy momentum vector, and you can think of them as um, so you can think of P as a as a vector. Uh, as a vector on the asymptotic Euclidean limit of the spacetime, and so EP EP together form a spacetime uh, a spacetime vector at infinity, if you like. Um, it's the the basic idea, and so um, right, and so those are those are the um, total energy and momentum, and so um, in order to be a physically reasonable spacetime, of course the matter fields have to satisfy appropriate conditions. And so um, so in, in particular, the mass density of the matter should be positive. And so so via the Einstein equations, remember the Einstein equations relate curvature properties of the metric with the matter fields. So inequalities on the matter fields give us information about the geometry of the metric, uh, inequality information. And so um, so the um, in order to prove the um, uh, Positive mass theorems. The energy condition that's needed is the what's called the dominant energy condition. So it's the requirement that um, that the um, the energy momentum vector that is E j uh, is forward pointing and time like. So so it's if you like it's the it's the statement that the 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 energy density of the matter is non negative for any observer moving in a time like direction. And so that's a, a condition which is normally assumed on matter fields, and it seems to be absolutely necessary for, for the, um, the theorems that we want. <clears throat> and so um, I should mention just some language here. So um, in, the, in the constraint equations, we go back to those. Um, <clears throat> if you assumed uh, that the trace of k is zero, if you assume k is zero, then then there's only one scalar constraint equation. And then the dominant energy condition just says that the scalar curvature of the metric uh, uh, G is non-negative. So non-negative scalar curvature is a special case. And it, it's, it's called the Riemannian case for, the, um, um, for these theorems. And, um, <clears throat> and notice that's also true if case, trace K is, um, is zero. So if trace K is zero, then the non-negativity of mu implies the uh, scalar curvature is non-negative. So, so this subject is very closely related to studying Riemannian manifolds with non-negative scalar curvature. However, in general, if k is not zero, the dominant energy condition is is a, a somewhat more complicated um, condition. It involves the two tensors g and k, and so and so it's um, it's um, <clears throat> the methods involved are uh, are. A bit more complicated uh, in the general case. So the general case, when k k or trace k are not zero, is often referred to in um, <clears throat> relativity as the space space time case. And so the two the two cases we consider are <clears throat> the Riemannian case and the general case is the uh, it's called the space time case. Okay. And so what are the positive mass or energy theorems we're interested in? Well, so. Um, <clears throat> So the Riemannian positive mass theorem says that if I have a, an initial data set, so in this, this is the Riemannian case, so K doesn't play a role. Um, if we assume it's asymptotically flat, non-negative scalar curvature, and we also have to assume that RG is integrable. I should have, I think I said that on the previous slides. In order for the, the mass and the total mass and the linear momentum to be defined, well-defined, you have to assume that mu, mu and J, the norm of J, are integrable. On the space time, otherwise it, it could be infinite. Um, okay, and so um, so the Riemannian positive mass theorem says that if we have a manifold of non-negative scalar curvature with Rg integrable, then the ADM mass E is non-negative and it's zero only if uh, only if uh, the manifold is isometric to uh, Euclidean space with a flat metric. <clears throat> and then the space time positive energy theorem would say in the general case MGK. It's asymptotically flat. These are integrable. Then uh, the the energy is non-negative, and it's zero only if MGK is embeddable as a space-like hypersurface in Minkowski space. So the the borderline case or the zero case for the space-time positive energy theorem characterizes 
space-like hypersurfaces in Minkowski space. So it's 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 a a more complicated situation than than the Riemannian one. And and there's actually a little more general statement which is closely related to the second one, which is that if um, is is that the the total energy ADM energy momentum vector uh, should be uh, forward pointing and time like and it's zero or null if and only if both are zero and it's embeddable. Okay. So that's a little more general statement than than uh, the second one. Okay, and so um, let me come to the Riemannian um, positive mass theorem. And so, um, so the the way that we prove this theorem, so we develop methods to do this to prove these theorems um, based on um, based on the theory of volume minimizing hypersurfaces. We so the the key background is that we recognize the connection between the um, stability of minimal hypersurfaces and non-negative scalar curvature and eventually also the dominant energy condition. And so and so um, the idea of the proof in n dimensions, so we originally did it in three dimensions, but in, in n dimensions, the idea is to show that um, um, <clears throat> if you had a counterexample in dimension n, then you would produce a counterexample in dimension n minus one, and then you could continue to slice down to three dimensions or even two dimensions uh, and uh, uh, deduce a, a contradiction to, to, the, um, to the theorem. And so uh, there's an initial step, which, uh, which I won't talk about, but, but it, we, uh, it, it turns out it's no loss of generality to assume that the asymptotics of the metric is quite is simple. Namely, it's the Schwarzschild asymptotics, and I forgot the four over n minus two there, um, and then plus terms that decay faster, where E is negative. Um, and, and, and then the idea was to um, understand, so, that, so the, the, the basic principle is that the scalar curvature being non-negative is supposed to imply something about the asymptotics, which is incompatible with, with, uh, with, the, uh, with the asymptotic form there. And so what geometric property uh, is involved? Well, um, the key property turns out to be that if you look at, um, if you look at a large slab, so that's the reason I wanted to use the board a little bit. <clears throat> so, um, So we had this, um, so we think of a large slab near infinity. So this is X, Xn equals a large constant lambda. And down here is <clears throat> Xn equals a, a, a large negative constant minus lambda. And then the, um, the, the manifold in here is, is, is some, we don't know what's going on there, but these two, the boundary of the slab appears near, near infinity. And so, and so then the idea, the idea of the proof uh, is to do a little calculation and show that, so when you compute the mean curvature of the boundary, so you take the trace of the second fundamental form, you think of the boundary as, you think of the boundary of the slab, so the normal points upward on top and downward below. When you compute the mean curvature of that, if you did it in Euclidean space, of course, you would get zero. They're, they're totally geodesic. Um, but if you, when, when you do it for the perturbed metric, it turns out the, the, of course, the leading order term is the energy. And so what happens is that the energy is negative, then this becomes a mean convex slab. So in other words, the, the mean curvature, the mean curvature of the slab uh, points inward on, at the top and, and upward at the bottom. And so that's, it's, it's mean convex. So it's in relativity lingo, it's trapped. It would be called a trapped um, uh, the boundary is is trapped, and so um, and so then the idea is is because of that property we can consider we can construct a hypersurface in here with by we can do it by considering a large cylinder here in the vertical cylinder, uh, and then if I took any large uh, boundary there, um, if I took a, a sphere there, then I could I could produce a, a, a volume minimizer with that boundary. When I do that, because the boundary is there is trapped, the, the solution will lie inside the, the slab. And so, and so that means when I let the boundary go to infinity, that those hypersurfaces are trapped in here. And so I'll be able to construct a limit, which is a, another, is an N minus one dimensional asymptotically flat manifold. 
And so, uh, and so that's the idea. So I've put the formulas here. So we consider a boundary gamma, which is at radius r and height h. So we consider varying the height also. Uh, and then we, we produce a volume minimizer. We minimize the volume for the boundary and that I'll call that sigma rh. And then because the, um, the surfaces are all trapped in the slab, we can take a limit of those, um, those um, surfaces. And then we produce, uh, for any given h, we produce a complete surface. So, that, uh, so that's sigma r. So we take a limit, and uh, <clears throat> so so we we produce so for any for any height we can produce a radius r, and then we also have the property that if we move the the boundary up and down between minus lambda and lambda, we can then consider minimizing the um, the volume. And and the point is when we get when we if the radius were at the top or the bottom, that would never achieve the minimum because because the the mean convexity we could push it down and reduce the volume. So in particular, for any uh, radius, there's a there's a particular height at which it's the volume is smallest, and then we can take a limit as r tends to infinity using compactness results for um, volume minimizing hypersurfaces, and we produce a limit sigma n minus one, which is an asymptotically flat uh, n minus one manifold. Uh, and it's uh, it's stable with respect to uh, it's stable when we when we when we move it the volume will locally increase and so it's uh, it satisfies a, an eigenvalue condition stability is a, a, a um, eigenvalue condition for variations and the, these these conditions I won't I'm not I'm going to skip some details here and not write it down but one of the key things is that the stability of the hypersurface is related to the ability to conformally deform the metric on the hypersurface. And so the conditions that it be stable for compactly supported variations and for ones which are translations near infinity imply that the metric on sigma can be conformally deformed to zero scalar curvature and with negative mass. So the ability to translate at infinity allows us to control the sign of the mass. So sigma n minus one itself has zero mass originally because its decay will be faster than uh, then, um, uh, then uh, fast enough, it, it will be equivalent to the decay in n dimensions, which is which is too fast for sigma n minus one. But of course, it doesn't satisfy the constraint equations. So we impose the constraint equations using a conformal deformation, and we produce a counterexample in dimension n minus one. So assuming we had negative energy in dimension n, we produce one in n minus one, and then we can repeat the argument a finite number of times and get a um, what, what we call the slicing by minimal hypersurfaces, and we go down to three or even two dimensions, and, and we get a contradiction. So that's the idea of the uh, of the uh, n-dimensional proof. Okay, and so and so why and so that work that actually works fine up to dimension seven. So why why the why the seven? Well, the reason is because um, volume minimizing hypersurfaces have this strange feature that in manifolds of dimension less than or equal to seven. They're always smooth. They're they're smooth, but in dimension eight and higher, there are examples of of, um, of volume minimizing hypersurfaces, boundaries which span volume minimizers, which actually have singular singular sets. They they can have small singular sets. In dimension eight, they're isolated, but in higher dimensions, they could be, you know, closed sets of Hausdorff dimension at most n minus seven. Uh, sorry, n minus eight, I guess. Uh, so, uh, sorry, yeah, n minus, n, n is the ambient dimensions. Yeah, so n minus eight, right. Um, and so um, uh, actually a few years ago, uh, we dealt with this problem. We were able to do the slicing argument uh, in the presence of singularities and show that for the low, the low dimensional slices, in particular, the two dimensional slice we get actually is regular. And so, and so in fact, with a lot more work, we were able to extend this, this theorem to uh, to n dimensions to all dimensions, and so um, let me also mention the spinner the Dirac argument. So um, so uh, so we did this work uh, on positive mass theorem in the late seventies, and um, a, a year or two later, uh, Ed Witten developed a Dirac operator method to prove the same theorem. So so in three dimensions, both of the methods prove prove the um, the um, positive mass theorem. But, um, and, and in fact, the Dirac approach does extend to all dimensions, but it, it, ha it has a condition. It requires that the manifold M be a spin manifold. 
So in the spin manifold case, you don't need the the um, the, uh, the the more difficult argument. Um, but on the other hand, <clears throat> people have tried to use the the spinner method to handle non-spin manifolds and and has not have not succeeded so so far. There have been various attempts at that. Okay, and so let me mention another important proper an important aspect of um, which comes into this for um, um, for uh, these singularities. So so we don't really understand the singularities very well. Um, so the question of whether singularities are um, are stable in the sense that if you perturb the data. So um, so as an example, in the in the 80s, it was shown by Hart and Simon that for an open dense set of boundaries in R8, the, uh, they, they actually span smooth volume minimizers. In other words, you can have a boundary and they definitely do exist in eight dimensions where the, where the minimizer is singular, but you can always perturb it to make, and, and, and so that you have a minimizer for the perturbed boundary, which is regular. And so that was done in the eight dimensional case by Hart and Simon. And then, and then Nat Smale, who's a former student of mine, generalized that to, or extended that to the case of Riemannian manifolds. So he showed that if you have a, a, uh, a uh, integral homology class, uh, seven dimensional class in an eight manifold, then by perturbing the metric a little bit, you can make the minimizer in that class be regular. You can get rid of the singularities. And so actually last year, it's a rather interesting development in this direction. Um, the, these results were extended two more dimensions, dimension nine and 10 by uh, Chodash, Montalides, and, uh, and Schultz. And so let me just comment, in, in the proof of the positive mass theorem, we do have the flexibility to perturb the metric. And so um, these generic regularity results can be used to avoid the singularity issue. So if, if that were true in all dimensions, then that would give, a, that would greatly simplify the, the, um, the proof of the uh, uh, Riemannian positive mass theorem. Okay, and so um, let me talk now about the second theorem I want to talk about is the um, uh, is the um, uh, Riemannian Penrose inequality, and so this is um, maybe less well known than the than the um, uh, than the um, positive mass theorem. It, it's actually a gen, uh, an extension. To, it's a it's a theorem that characterizes the Schwarzschild metric, and so and so the um, the the Penrose inequality is says generally that if you consider black hole space time, so those are space times which have horizons. So, so a, a, a horizon is, so it's, it's a, in the Riemannian case, it's a, it's a minimal surface, which is, which is outer minimizing. So it, so it doesn't, there's no other surface surrounding it with smaller volume. And so uh, uh, generally in the space time case, the, the, the corresponding condition is called a MOTS. So it's, a marginally outer trap surface. So, you know, uh, Penrose's Nobel Prize winning theorem says that when you have a trap surface, a closed trap surface, it leads to a singularity. And so the MOTS, so you can consider regions bounded by the surface and you can consider a maximal one. And so the boundary of that would be marginally trapped. And so that notation MOTS is a marginally, a marginally outer trap surface. Okay, and so, um, and so the Penrose inequality um, which is motivated from the evolution problem in, in um, relativity, um, <clears throat> suggests that the, 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 that among all extensions, uh, among all, all, um, um, uh, uh, among all, all black hole data with a given area, a given volume for the boundary, the Schwarzschild solution should have the smallest mass. Okay, so the positive mass theorem says that among all asymptotically flat metrics, the Euclidean space has the smallest mass, which is zero. So, so in this case, you, you, you normalize the volume of the, of the horizon, and then you assert that the mass is minimized by the, um, by the Schwarzschild metric, which is the one I wrote down earlier. And so, um, and so the, there's a, in the three-dimensional case, this was done around 2000 in the Riemannian case. So I should say this is a wide open problem in the, in the space-time case. Um, there are some very weak results on it. So not very much is known, but in the Riemannian case, there is a theorem, and I'll give the, the references in a minute, but, but in the Riemannian case, it can be written ex explicitly because the, this 
term here is just the square root of a over 16 pi is the energy of the um, of the uh, Schwarzschild metric, which is the exterior part. The part the horizon turns out in this um, formulation to occur when at radius e over two, and so and so the, if you compute the area of that, you get that the energy is bigger than or equal to square root of a over 16 pi. Okay, so it says among all non-negative scalar curvature metrics with integrable scalar curvature, where the boundary is an outer minimizing minimal surface, it's an outermost um, uh, horizon, then the mass should be not only positive, but actually bounded below by an exact uh, an explicit quantity involving the area, and the equality is achieved for the exterior short field. Okay, and so uh, we say this was first proven around 2000 by um, by H Gerard Huskin and uh, Ilmanen uh, for the case of a connected boundary. And they used a geometric flow um, uh, called the inverse mean curvature flow uh, to do it. And then, a, and then a year or two later, uh, the theorem was, um, uh, a new proof was given by Bray, which also gave the result for disconnected boundary. So Bray's proof also works without assuming the horizon is connected. Okay, and so let me say that the proof of Huskin Nillman and does not seem to work in, in higher dimensions, but the Bray argument was extended for uh, n up to seven by Bray and Dan Lee. And I should say the result not known for n greater than or equal to eight. And I, I, wanna, I wanna describe the issues involved in that just in a few minutes here. Um, <clears throat> okay, and so, and so let me explain the idea of the Bray proof because it's a little more it's a little more complicated than than the the Huskin Ullman, the the inverse mean curvature, but the idea is is easy to motivate. So 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 first of all, the um, the Penrose inequality is the characterization of the Schwarzschild space time, and so and so the um, the characterization uh, of the uh, the characterization that is used essentially is the one which characterizes the Schwarzschild space time as the unique static black hole solution of the vacuum Einstein equations, right? And so that theorem, actually it's an old theorem that partial results were proven you know, long ago, I won't give the full history, but that, that there was a general argument given by Bunting and Massoud uh, in, the, in the late 80s. Um, and that argument was extended, that was done in three dimensions. It was extended to higher dimensions by Gibbons, Ida, and Shiramitsu. And the, the, the static vacuum conditions uh, yield give a, a scalar flat metric on MG, which is on a manifold outside a boundary uh, sphere. So the boundary again is the, in the, um, the horizon uh, and it has compact boundaries and there's a, a function, a static potential uh, defined on M minus on, on M. And it, it satisfies a Hessian equation, which is the static vacuum equations. In particular, it's a harmonic function though. And it it is zero on on the horizon, and it tends to one at infinity. So that's the the uh, a static black hole metric. And so um, so the um, it, it turns out because v is zero on the boundary, the the boundary is actually automatically totally geodesic, not only minimal. And so Bunting and Massoud gave uh, used a a doubling construction. So they they took the manifold. With boundary, and then they double they doubled it. They just doubled it across the boundary, which is a totally geodesic surface. So the metric is not quite smooth, but almost. Uh, and then they extended v, the the harmonic, the the potential function by odd reflection to the double. Okay, and then they considered the conformal factor u, or the function u, which is one half one plus v on the double. So v was tending to one at, at the original infinity. So this function u now tends to one there, but at the other infinity, v tends to minus one. And so u tends to zero at the other infinity. And so then they considered the conformal metric uh, u to the fourth times g. That then has zero scalar curvature because u is harmonic uh, and it has zero mass in their case because it turns out the asymptotics of v coming from the Hessian equation give you the, the mass in the asymptotics and turns out to be zero. And so then they used the positive mass theorem to say that the metric was conformally flat and then they could deduce that it was actually Schwarzschild. So that's that's the argument. So that's the, the bunting Massoud doubling argument. And then that was extended to higher dimensions uh, by um, the authors I mentioned. So then um, Bray used the same doubling argument 
across a minimal boundary. So instead of the boundary being totally geodesic, it's minimal. And he, he constructed, he did it for the harmonic function V, which is zero on sigma and tends to one at infinity. Well, V won't be a satisfy the Hessian type equation, but, but you can always construct such a harmonic function. Uh, it's zero on the boundary and tends to one at, at infinity. Um, and then the um, between zero lies between zero and one. And so, so then the application of the positive mass theorem, so he then showed you could again use the same bunting Massoud construction. So what it gives is um, a lower bound on the mass by a positive quantity. The quantity is, is actually half of the capacity of the boundary surface. So the so the, the function V, if you can compute its Dirichlet integral, that's called the capacity of, of the boundary in, in M. And, um, and the, the inequality gives, gives a, a lower bound by the capacity. Well, that isn't the same, of course, as the area, so it, it doesn't directly give the Penrose. But um, what Bray observed is that you can interpret that inequality in terms of a flow. So, so he, he considered um, the problem of deforming the boundary outward in the original manifold and simultaneously deforming the metric exterior to, uh, to the deformed surface conformally. So, so he considered constructing a flow and you, you, it's not obvious it exists, but that's part of the, um, the construction. So <clears throat> you consider a family of hypersurfaces, sigma t, uh, so t is between zero and infinity, and <clears throat> you deform the metric conformally by a factor ut to the four over n minus two. And then um, the flow is determined by the conditions that sigma t should be outer minimizing uh, and a minimal surface for gt. And the, U, the, the rate of change of ut with respect to t is given by vt, where I take u0 to be one. vt is the harmonic function, which is zero on sigma t and which tends to minus e to the minus t at infinity. The reason for this minus e to the minus t is when I differentiate it, it, it it's positive, it increases in t. Okay, and then what Bray observed was that the mass capacity inequality uh, is precisely the statement that under this flow, if you can construct it, uh, the mass the mass will decrease. And so <clears throat> the volume of the boundary remains fixed because the flow is, because the, U, the UT is just one on the inner boundary. So it doesn't change the, the, um, uh, the boundary volume. So the boundary volume is the same, the mass decreases and then, um, and then he showed that the uh, the uh, uh, the final step is show that the flow converges to the short shield metric. So the so the limiting metric would be one where the mass doesn't decrease. And so if the mass is constant, uh, if the derivative is zero, then that implies again by the positive mass theorem that the uh, space is conformally flat, and then you can show that it's it's short shield. Okay, and so. And so the key things are the existence of such a flow. And so you do have to allow jumps. So you have to allow sigma t to jump to a, 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 a larger surface. So presumably there are a finite number of jumps for uh, a finite time value, but I don't think that's quite obvious, but, but it, um, it, it, can, it can jump at, at certain times. And then uh, the remaining arguments uh, involve this, um, this uh, um, uh, bunting Massoud reflection argument to get the mass decreasing. And so um, so if you consider this for higher dimensions uh, where you may have singularities um, in the in the uh, manifolds, the two main issues that are required to extend the argument are first of all, the construction of the flow. So so the the construction of the flow technically does use the regularity properties of the of the horizon. They have to minimize volume and then and then they use compactness properties of volume minimizers to get the flow in a good sense. But I, I'm pretty sure there should be a, um, a a sort of weak version of the flow. Uh, but I think the more tricky thing is um, is uh, to do this um, bunting Massoud argument when you reflect across a, a horizon which may have a small singular set. So, so there's a singular set on the boundary and uh, it doesn't really fit into the um, the uh, the things used in the Riemannian case, and so um, so that's this 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 one. And of course, there's another issue, which is constructing the harmonic functions with a singular boundary. And I, I think that part should be okay, too. But so I think a lot of this argument will work, but there's still some issues involved in in uh, in extending that the higher dimension. I should say that this particular um, theorem, the Riemannian positive mass theorem, this is the only proof we know. There there doesn't there's no Dirac 
proof that that is known for this problem. So, so it's um, <clears throat> uh, so that you really have to deal with singularity issues in all cases. Okay, and so I want to just end the talk, uh, spending um, fifteen minutes or so on on the space-time positive uh, energy theorem. Okay, and so um, so now for this one we consider um, a, a general initial data set MGK just satisfying the dominant energy condition. And of course, we assume the integrability conditions. Um, and so um, the motivation for this argument is that the borderline case of the space-time positive energy theorem should be th that when the data is realized on a hypersurface in Minkowski space. Okay, and so whatever argument you use, you have to understand um, the, border the borderline case. And so, um, so again, the positive... <clears throat> So the positive energy theorem really characterizes um, spa arbitrary space-like hypersurfaces, and so it's a it's a much more much larger set of cases where um, uh, the uh, energy and momentum are zero. And so, um, so back in about 1977, when we were we were trying to extend the Riemannian theorem, we found a, a paper. So this was maybe a year after this paper was written, in 78. Uh, we found a paper by uh, by Jung. Zhang was a student of Garrosh, Robert Garrosh in Chicago. Um, and um, it, it contained an interesting characterization of, of these space-like hypersurfaces. And eventually we were able to, to use that to, uh, to uh, uh, find a way of reducing the space-time case uh, to the Riemannian case by solving an auxiliary equation, which we called the Zhang equation. And so I'd like to just motivate that because um, it may not be known to a lot of people in the audience, although it's an old, an old work. So, um, so, uh, <clears throat> so let's so let's first think about space-like hypersurfaces in Minkowski space. So, so such a, a hypersurface is the graph of a of a function. So, x zero is f of x, x x one up to x n, uh, and the induced metric g i j on the graph from use the induced metric from the uh, the Minkowski metric is uh, delta i j minus DIF DJF and the norm of the gradients less than one. That's the condition that 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 the hypersurface be space like. So it's the metric is positive definite. Okay, and so what we can do obviously is we can just add uh, DI DJF to both sides, and we get that the Euclidean metric delta IJ is the sum GIJ plus DIF DJF, and so this metric GIJ plus DI JF DJ DIF DJF is precisely the induced metric um, of the graph of F, the function F, in M cross R, where we take M to be the Riemannian metric on the um, space like hypersurface, and we just take the, re the Riemannian product, M cross R. And so um, if I take the graph of F in there, then, then that's the induced metric. So, so in particular, the Euclidean metric is embedded in a natural way as the graph. Uh, as the graph of a function in M cross R for such a hypersurface. And the other observation made by uh, John, it's easy to check, is that the second fundamental form, K of M in Minkowski space, actually also agrees with that of the graph of F in M cross R. So Kij <clears throat> in M cross R, th this is the second fundamental form, the, the Hessian of F divided by that, that expression where D, D is the induced connection on M. The right-hand side is, is just Hij, which is the, the second fundamental form in Minkowski space. So in particular, it gives a, an interesting characterization of space-like hypersurfaces in Minkowski space. Namely, um, it's embeddable as a space-like hypersurface in, in Minkowski space uh, if and only if uh, there's a function F on M whose graph in M cross R is flat. So it's it's... Uh, a flat metric, and whose second fundamental form is equal to that of k. k is given, and so that's the uh, that's a characterization. And so those conditions, of course, cannot generally be achieved. I mean, that the it, it would be a very special thing for a for a an initial data set to be embeddable in Minkowski space. But nonetheless, the the, the conditions have to have to be understood in terms of the. Um, the construction, so that's a it's a borderline case in the in the problem, and so um, and so um, 
So the idea then, the Zhang equation, is to not look at the full set of equations, but to look at the traced equations. Okay, and so, and so we consider MGK and we form M cross R, the Riemannian product, and then we extend K to the product where we just take it to be parallel in the T direction. So T is in the R direction, and we take DDT to be a null vector for the form. And so in that way, we, we can, we're extending the initial data set we had to N plus one dimensions on M cross R, and then the, the metric is the Riemannian product, and the second fundamental form is extended in that trivial way. Um, and so, um, and so the, and then the idea is to take a trace. So the, so the condition that, that would say that the second fundamental form is equal to that of, of F would be, it would be that this is zero for each I and J. So if we take a trace where G bar is the, is the induced metric on the hypersurface, then this is the Jung equation. And so it's an equation for a single function F, uh, and, um, <clears throat> Uh, it, sa it, it, it satisfies the property that has, it has basic geometric meaning. Namely, the first term in this equation is just the mean curvature of the graph. So it says the mean curvature of the graph is equal to the trace of K restricted to the, to the graph. And that's exactly the Mott's equation for this, if we think of it, the, extended, um, uh, the extended initial data set. And so, and so you can think of the Zhang equation as the Mott's equation for this in one dimension higher. Now, um, so we realize that the, the graph of the solution of the Zhang equation, assuming there is a solution, um, would be automatically satisfy a stability property. And again, I haven't written those things those down carefully in the lecture for lack of time, but uh, it would satisfy a stability property, which, which implies the, this inequality, the, the more standard sort of uh, instability uh, Positivity eigenvalue positivity property, namely. So this is the uh, this is just the connection on the graph. Phi is a phi is a function. It, it can be either compactly supported or it can be asymptotic to a constant at infinity. R bar is just the scalar curvature of the of the graph, and this term here, norm chi squared, chi is the difference between k and h. So remember, in the borderline case, k equals h, and so so it's natural that that term would appear there, um, and so. Um, we then observe that this eigenvalue condition, again, is related to the ability to conformally deform the metric. It's related to the Yamabe positivity or the positivity of the lowest eigenvalue, the conformal Laplace. We use this to show that <clears throat> given any initial data set satisfying dominant energy condition, there's a new one which is of this form. So we first deform the metric, we take the metric on the graph, and then we solve, uh, we solve for U uh, which has zero scalar curvature, as it's asymptotically flat, and it has smaller total energy. Okay, and then using the Riemannian positive mass theorem, we then get the space-time positive energy theorem. So what it says that is that any an arbitrary um, space-time initial data set has a an associated Riemannian data set which has smaller energy. So in particular, the positivity of the energy for the Riemannian case implies the result for the space-time case. So that, that's the argument. And actually the Zhang equation has been used to do many other things, which I don't have time to talk about here, but, but uh, I just wanna <clears throat> say that there, there's another twist in the argument, and that is that we assumed in the argument that the solution exists, but, but actually the solution doesn't always ex exist. So it turns out that um, the existence of solutions um, is it, not always true. And you can, the obstruction it turns out comes from Mott's in the original uh, uh, data set, the, the original manifold M. So I've drawn one there. And then I can think of taking the Riemannian product of that. And so you can think of that. So that's, of course, not a graph, but it's a, you could think of it as possibly a limit of graphs. So you could imagine a graph which becomes steeper and steeper and which approaches such a cylinder asymptotically. And it, it turns out that that's exactly what, what happens. And so we, um, we showed that um, that the solution exists outside a collection, a disjoint collection of MOTs. So the MOTs can be either forward or forward uh, or backward uh, MOTs. So there, there's a plus and a minus there. And so they correspond to the solution blowing to plus infinity or minus infinity. Uh, and so I found this picture on the internet. So this is supposed to be the MOT solution, which converges asymptotically to minus infinity 
uh, to approaches the cylinder. And so, and so it turns out the obstruction to existence is precisely the MOTS in the original, um, in the original um, initial data set. Um, and, um, uh, and then, and then in order to, to handle the argument, so, so we, we solved the equation then by, by regularizing it. So we introduced, um, it turns out if you put an epsilon F on the right-hand side, you can always solve the equation. So it enables you to give a bound on, on F depending on epsilon. Uh, and then for the regularized equation, we constructed a smooth solution, zero at infinity. And then uh, we showed them that the only possible blow up can occur is, is, um, is the, the, when the solution is asymptotic to either this MOTS at plus infinity or the MOTS at minus infinity cylinder over the MOTS. And so, and so the solution exists outside of a, a um, disjoint union of, um, of MOTS in the original initial data set. Uh, and then we carried out the, um, the, the reduction of the space-time case allowing the singularities, the possibility of singularities. We did it in dimension three, uh, but um, the method was extended up to dimension seven by Eichmere. But it's a very, sim very similar uh, in, in, high, in higher dimensions. Um, and so, um, so generally the, the blow up of solutions is they're asymptotic to these cylinders. So on the cylinder, um, so, so the, the cylinder, um, it turns out also is a stable MOTS. And so, so in particular, the, the equation we're solving, which is the conformal Laplacian on, on the MOTS has positive lowest eigenvalue. So if we call that eigenvalue lambda, then on the cylinder, there are two basic positive solutions, del u equals zero, namely e to the plus square root lambda t and e to the minus square root lambda t, where, uh, where phi is the positive lowest eigenfunction. And then since the John graph is asymptotic to the cylinder, um, we, we can construct two basic positive solutions, u0 and u1. So u0 satisfies the property that uh, they're both solutions of LU equals zero. U zero tends to zero at the cylindrical ends. So we, we now have we now have more, more ends for the manifold uh, and it tends to one at the asymptotically flat end. Whereas U one will grow exponentially at the cylindrical ends and will go to zero at the asymptotically flat ends. So um, we can consider those two, instead of the single conformal factor, we consider those two. And then to complete the proof, if, if we had E negative, we could construct a, a conformal metric, which is corresponding to U0 and then plus a very small constant times U1. U1 is the one that blows up at the cylindrical ends. Um, and, and then the metric, we take this metric, then it's asymptotically flat with zero scalar curvature, but now it has the extra ends corresponding to each of the MOTs. Uh, so these ends are large though, because U epsilon is positive and U1 blows up exponentially so so they're good ends and so and so we can carry through the proof of the Riemannian positive mass theorem for metrics of that type um, if, if epsilon is small enough this gives a contradiction because the um, the contribution to the energy from u naught is negative and e is negative so the so u1 contributes a fixed amount if we if we multiply by a small constant we get we get a negative energy Riemannian uh, initial data set. Okay, and so um, in the high dimensional case, um, <clears throat> let me just say that um, we can try to do the same thing. So, so I wanna emphasize in high dimensions, the solution of the Zhang equation is still smooth. It's just that the, the MOTs themselves may be singular. So what can happen is that, is that the Zhang solution as you approach plus infinity will have curvature that blows up at, at a small set of points. Right, so it can, it's approaching this singular cylinder. And so that definitely does happen. It, it can happen in, in some cases. And so we have to understand that setting. So, so it turns out this is one of the cases where you can handle it. So, so um, the idea is that because the singularities are small, we, we give good behavior on the regular set, we can show that the singularities don't really matter. And so, and so this, is, this turns out to be a situation like that. And so... Um, and so we can, again, it's possible to show that the, um, the conformal Laplacian L still has discrete spectrum on the, um, on the singular MOTs. So, so um, the singularities, it turns out, don't, don't, don't affect that, that property for the conformal Laplacian. That, again, follows from minimal surface type property, Sobolev inequalities and things of that sort. Um, 
but and and so we can still construct the two basic positive solutions on on the mutts. Now the eigenfunction phi generally will blow up as we approach the singular point, so it's not a smooth function on on the mutts. It's not even bounded; it will it will blow up. But um, so it's a little more effort to go from the from the cylinder to the graphical solution in this case. But um, the claim is we can still construct these two um, uh, basic solutions. So the U0, which will tend to zero. So it won't tend to zero pointwise everywhere, but it tends to zero on the regular set of the, of the um, cylinder. And, and it will tend to zero in the L2 sense on, on the cylindrical ends. And still sufficient to do the conformal deformation of the metric because the U1 will blow up pointwise uh, exponentially. And so, um, so the, uh, in that way, we can again construct a counterexample to the Riemannian case. It has these extra ends, but they're geometrically well behaved. And so, so again, we get a, um, a contradiction from that. Okay, so there are a lot of details, of course, which I'm not able to give here, but, um, but uh, that's the last mathematical slide I have. I have just one more slide, which is one of my favorite old pictures from, uh, this is probably from the early 80s. You, you have this picture, right? Yeah. So this is uh, this is me. That's back back when I was about thirty years old or or so. And this is Robert Bartnick, who's um, who was a, a student of Yao, who unfortunately passed away a few years ago. Um, and this is Leon Simon, who was um, Yao and Simon were both at Stanford when I was a student there. In fact, I was a joint student of, of theirs. And this is the young St. Yao. Uh, and so. Uh, Anyway, so it's uh, that's all I had to say. So thank you. You don't have that? Yeah, I'll send it to you. Yeah, it, it's a great one. Yeah. <laughs>